Okay, um, welcome to the talk Querying Common Space here tonight or this afternoon, this sunny afternoon, a debate on visibility, unsafe urban spaces and the everyday archive. Before I'm going to introduce us and the, those wonderful people who are here with us in the studio physically and virtually, I would like to read a quote from a book which has become very dear to me and I guess to many of us to let's say break the ice. So let me read that quote first. The Queen's dress in those parts of the devastated city which the men have abandoned. In the spaces created by ruined buildings the Queens have made a dazzling new world. It is all trickery, of course. Fabrics and dim lights and soft pillows and tinkly sounds and sweet smells and laughter everywhere as the queens dress for the streets. The queens live on the streets. They eat off the streets. They conduct their business in the streets. They have their love affairs on the streets. They make the men on the streets very uncomfortable, sometimes even violent. It amuses the queens to see the men in such a state. Having said that, um, let me introduce ourselves first, uh, namely the core project team of Queering Common Space, a project by Polygonal Office for Urban Communication. So here uh, on the chair across of me is uh, Nancy Nasser al -Din. Nancy is a Lebanese urban researcher and architect based here in Berlin. Nancy took part in projects with different collectives in Cairo, in Beirut, but also here in Berlin. And her work mainly involves using design and research as a tool of activism by studying the politics of bodies in urban space. Then, um, next to Nancy, there is Christian Heid. Christian is an architect, sociologist, based in Berlin as well. And Christian mainly writes about, researches and teaches in international urbanism at the Technical University in Berlin. Uh, and his main research interests are public space, informal urbanism and transformative city planning. And uh, three years ago, he established the office Polygonal, Office for Urban Communication, together with me. And um, I'm, I'm Lukas Staudinger. I'm also an architect, urban communicator with an interest in contemporary urban planning, urban everyday life. And together as Polygonal, we develop communication formats at the intersection of urban practice, art and architecture. And also I'm going to be the moderator for this talk today. Um, together, the three of us, Nancy, Christian and myself, we initiated the project Queering Common Space a living archive of queer experiences and um, stories from urban space in two cities, namely Tbilisi and Berlin. Um, that's because the project was developed for and also featured in the Tbilisi Architecture Biennial 2020 in Georgia. So today we would like to talk about that project with a really wonderful group of people who, col uh, who collaborated with us um, on Queering Common Space, among many others. Uh, so not so there are more people than you will get to know today. Um, who, people who created wonderful contributions to that archive. Um, so what we would like to discuss today is mainly the visibility of queerness in urban space, the notion of unsafe or safer spaces, and the power of archiving queerness. So that sounds like a lot, but you will actually, I guess you will actually find out um, what this all is going to be about. So also here in the studio, not physically, but virtually, are the following people. I would like, uh, pe uh, people that, uh, who I would like to introduce now. Uh, so there is Liz Rosenfeld. Liz is a Berlin-based artist who works in film, video, performance and personal discursive, uh, discursive writing practice. Then there is uh, David Apakitze. 
David is a visual artist, curator, art historian and researcher based in Tbilisi, Georgia. Uh, and David recently um, co-created the, the platform Fungus, which is a queer art, art platform in Caucasia. Then there is Nini Godarice, uh, also a, a Tbilisi, Georgian-based fashion designer and visual artist. Nini's main interests are in, uh, environmental and ecological studies with the human body as the object of investigation. So welcome to um, um, the, the Georgian um, party. And there is Tseshi Lei, also here in Berlin. Tseshi is a post-human queer artist based in Berlin, grounding their practice into a collaborative network with various life forms. So we will, of course, hear about uh, those wonderful protagonists more from themselves. Um, but first, I would like to ask my fellow colleagues and soulmates and partners in crime, um, Nancy and Christian, what is queering common space actually? So maybe Christian, you could start with a few words on the project and what it is about. Of course, of course. Uh, so with Queering Common Space, um, we wanted to create a platform that collects visual uh, and acoustic representations and documentations of queer memories, of queer encounters, of queer experiences uh, related to urban space or common urban space. And we started this project um, a couple of months ago um, and uh, the project is based here in Berlin as well as in Tbilisi. So this is also reflected in uh, the protagonists that we have uh, with us today. So we from Polygonal created this uh, project um, initially in the framework of the Tbilisi Architecture Biennial uh, uh, 2020. So it was launched a couple of months ago um, and we are at the very beginning of building up an archive of those queer experiences. So uh, we um, understand this as a dig digital archive and as a living archive. So um, the archive is an, on a, it's based on a website, it's an internet platform and we, we can show you the, uh, the web link later. Um, and uh, it is living also in the sense that it can grow and that it can constantly expand. So this is the beginning and our idea is that we, that we fill this archive with uh, new experiences and new memories. Uh, so who can contribute? Actually everyone uh, and everything uh, can be part of this archive. Um, so no queer experience is more important than the other one. Um, um, all the narratives, encounters and experiences, uh, modes of persistence, uh, resistance or also performative actions all count. They can be small, they can be big, they can be uh, mundane, they can be extraordinary. So um, uh, yeah, so we try to be as inclusive as possible. And maybe we can um, have, um, uh, we can show the website um, on, this, on the screen now so that you uh, get an idea um, um, how the website looks. So, um, in the beginning, um, uh, just to tell you how we started this project, in the beginning we uh, worked together with protagonists both from Tbilisi and Berlin um, and um, um, uh, some of them we have here today um, and uh, we were super happy that we could win all those protagonists of like we get to know amazing people uh, um, like mainly digitally unfortunately because uh, like we started the project during the lockdown and it was not possible to travel as initially was uh, we wanted to do um, so um, but uh, we started it with this protagonist, but now uh, the project should become a really open invitation for, for uh, um, uh, to others to share their stories of, of queering space and feeding the archive uh, with their experiences. Um, in terms of the format, there's a whole range of different formats that we allow, so we also want to be inclusive in that sense, so you can, um, we, can, we can upload like videos and stories and like we have a poem there already, so it can be text, it can be um, acoustic material, um, uh, voice recordings, um, drawings, images, all this kind of material, so we don't limit that to some certain format. And, uh, uh, what we see in this archive as it is so far and of, uh, with all the contributions that we have is really the sort of beauty of, uh, of queer representation and uh, also quite uh, like div the diversity of expression of um, how people express their queerness in space. 
So you mentioned the term archive quite a lot. Uh, I, I wonder why archive? Um, archiving, uh, uh, to us, I think I, I can speak for all of us, uh, became something uh, like really important because uh, out of um, the feeling that we have that uh, like our queer narratives uh, are often very underrepresented in a sort of like more general uh, public discourse. So it's about this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, lack that they uh, are not represented uh, uh, too much. And also like where we come from, like I'm planning or uh, myself and uh, like we as Polygonal come from, uh, particularly within like disciplines of urban planning um, and the way in which we envision a city of tomorrow, for example, uh, these uh, discourses are, uh, are not very vocal in that sense. So they are quite underrepresented. So um, um, what we want to do with this archive in the long run is that we want to sort of like record our own stories um, of, of queering space and also contribute in writing to our own history no? and not wait until others uh, like decide that um, these stories can be included in, um, 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 in a sort of more general um, history mm -hmm. like of that so nancy you 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 nod your head with <laughs> in approval so um when when we came up with the idea of of of, of doing this project queering common space which if you want to have a look uh, on the website right now it's www.queeringspace.xyz just for just so you know um Nancy, why why did you want to participate what, what was your motivation to be part of queering common space uh, so uh, in the very uh, beginning stages, when we started talking about the project, uh, we were toying with different ideas of how do we do this representation? Do we start with a map or do we create something that's a bit um, uh, more dynamic or in a sense not tied to a specific geolocation? And we thought of the idea of the archive because with, with, we, within the arena of creating safe spaces, we need to give the anonymity uh, possible for people to have the choice to, to either um, uh, decide on saying an actual space where uh, a specific representation or manifestation of queer activity happens or whether we prefer to keep that anonymous. Um, so in a sense, um, I feel like an archive, as we, we discuss it between the three of us, but also uh, in different spaces, uh, it is a tool of resistance. It is a tool of documentation, of not wiping away history and at, at really choosing our own narrative. This is what I was nodding when Christian was saying. Um, so in a way, when we first started talking about it, I, I thought personally, what, how do I link queer to space? How do I how do I link my my spatial practice with with my queer identity? And how does that manifest? And does it always have to manifest visually? Does it always have to manifest in a public space? It made me think also what public is, what commons is, what. And in a way, I feel like this archive we're building is um, an alternative commons in a sense. So how do we how do we think of the commons um, further away from actual physical space? Mm -hmm and hence dropping the geolocation and making it more um, a, a possibility. But yeah, in general, it's good to have a safe space that's, that's somewhere else, uh, not necessarily on the ground where people from Tbilisi, from Berlin, and hopefully from other cities around the world uh, or non-cities as well can join the discourse. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I, I hope that this has sort of um, uh, explained what queering common space is about, or what the what the aim or the goal, the objective, actually is. But now I would like to turn to those people who made the archive actually alive, namely the protagonists who contributed to the archive. So um, we have four protagonists here. We we always called them protagonists. I don't know how, why we came up with the term protagonists. I think it's. I don't know, we just fell in love with the term. I hope you are okay with it that we call you protagonists. <laughs> um, so we have four uh, protagonists here who, who developed really poetic contributions to the archive. Um, I would first like to have a look at a contribution from Georgia, from Tbilisi, and the work by David Apakitze. Can we see the illustration by David, please? Um, Okay, so the, pic the picture is on. Okay, so David, um, can you maybe say a few words about yourself, your practice as an, as an artist, 
and um, what's behind the quote lie is over lies over yes for sure so uh, hello everyone i'm david apukize i'm from based in tbc georgia and uh, so uh, always my works are um, on the same level as they're like uh, where I do visual arts. It's always ex I'm trying to explore something because I'm like a more explorer than visual artists, uh, I they think. So this thing is also um, this my work for um, Polygonal Berlin was also as well like uh, trying. To, I was trying to explore this queer places because uh, you know. Uh, in Tbilisi, it's not very, uh, like, uh, we only think when we speak about uh, queer places, we think about only, like, queer places, I mean, like, clubs and bars where, like, uh, these places were for queer, uh, for queer friendly, where it's, like, uh, queer people meeting each other, but I was thinking about other places, it's, like, uh, old Kojing area, and it's, uh, it's uh, like, in Tbilisi, near circus, and it's, like, really old encouraging area it's like I, I guess there, it's there from 80s maybe uh, so it was even in Soviet Union so there there are other people uh, like other gay, gay men who are not like openly gays and uh, um, this might I'm like holding this poster lies over and it's like replica of uh, Yoko Ono and Jodan Lennon did this sign like war is over and there was like uh, trying to force people to say that uh, they should to protest a war mm, the mm, crazy things that was American doing and of course it was very good like uh, thing to say but uh, it's actually changed nothing for real and uh, for me it's like I was asking myself as well though, so maybe I'm like trying to uh, say that uh, so it's it was more about visibility because like maybe I was trying to um, tell these people who are like living in this social uh, uh, crazy social construct which is very homophobic and they have to meet in this uh, cruising areas and they to they have to hide their identity they even don't know what is, is their identity uh, but i'm like uh, forcing them to say that okay let's uh, make a coming out but it's it's very hard to make it so uh, that's why I'm like standing in this cruising area, but the, I'm not standing there myself. I'm just photoshopped myself there. So it's like uh, really irony about queer activism at all, because in Georgia for um, like a lot of active activists, maybe me sometimes as well, we are just saying some words and we think that uh, we think only, uh, only about visibility, but so we don't think about the problems that queer community for real have. Yeah, For example, that uh, gay men who are like forced to have families they uh, they just can't live another life because they maybe can be killed in Georgia and just say that so visibility maybe of course it, it is uh, visibility is very important but there are some other things that are maybe more important than visibility. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to talk about visibility later because um, it's actually a very am am ambivalent or ambiguous term. No, I mean visibility per se does not necessarily mean that something is getting better. No, sometimes invisibility yeah, yeah, can that's, actually that's be. Yeah, that's what I'm saying about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. but we. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to come back to that topic uh, at a at mm -hmm. a at a later point. Um, since we've already talked about uh, David, thank you so much. Uh, since we've already thank talked you. about um, the queer practice of cruising and cruising grounds as a, let's say, queer connotated urban space, um, mm. maybe we could have a look at Liz Rosenfeld's contribution, Tremble, uh, because I think that the work trembles sort of touches the notion of cruising in a specific way as well. So maybe we can watch Tremble and then Liz, you can say a few words about yourself and the, and the work.
So thank you very much for showing the clip. Um, Liz, please. Um, hi, I'm Liz Rosenfeld. I'm a filmmaker. Uh, I guess um, that was already <laughs> stated. Um, I am um, also a performer and um, this piece that you just saw a clip from is from a longer work that is actually, um, it takes various different iterations actually, but it's it's intended to be an installed piece. Um, and the, the kind of story behind it is um, last summer when, um, well, as they still are in Berlin, um, during the period of the lockdown when um, all the bars and clubs were initially closed, I was um, able to get access to uh, a dark room that had not actually been, I would say, officially <laughs> used since um, the start of the uh, lockdown in Berlin in March. And so I became really interested in the space of the empty dark room, kind of like the abandoned um, dark room as this um, transitional space of time and bodies that were no longer there kind of a sense of, um, I'm really interested at the moment in queer abstraction and how we can sense bodies um, and narratives and biographies of queerness without actually seeing them. So this kind of questioning of representational politics. Um, and so we went down there, um, me and a few people who were helping me shoot that piece. And um, I also was at the time looking at the act of trembling as an action that was, has always historically either been uh, um, kind of written about or referred to a reaction um, in fear of something. Um, but, uh, and also of course, it's often an involuntary reaction for various different um, experiences um, of, of bodily histories. But I also was interested in it as, a, as an a action of resistance and kind of like erotic anticipation of something that we don't know is, is arriving yet. So that's how I was interacting with this space and thinking about how is the emptiness of, cru of cruising architecture at the moment, or as we, you know, are kind of assuming these empty cruising spaces are at the moment, um, what is happening to them and how are the architecture of, how are the architectures shifting and changing and what the, can they become? Um, and kind of also thinking of them as thresholds as well. Like spaces in between, mm -hmm. spaces yeah, it, in between you, spaces in between time almost, no? Like lost in time somehow. I mean, I think cruising spaces are always kind of these liminal, um, timeless spaces anyway. But certainly the thing that brings time into them is that they are, you know, historically assumed for cisgendered male mm -hmm. bodies or mm -hmm. bodies that can pass as readable male yeah. bodies. So... Um, I mean, I've been working with cruising as a methodology in my work for uh, 
20 years now in various different ways. So I find kind of, I keep finding this inspiration and different elements of it in terms of the architecture of it, not just the physical, but the emotional yeah. and the psychological architecture of it as well. I mean, generally speaking, that's, that's the beauty about the word architecture. No, it's not, it doesn't just mm -hmm. describe like a physical condition. It actually can describe so much more. And, uh, Absolutely. and, and that's, that's, that's one, I mean, that's why I'm in, still in love with architecture. No, I'll, I'll <laughs> still go do the same thing again. Um, so thank you, Liz, very much. I think this is a super interesting project and, um, like c conquering a space like this is per se already so super interesting uh thank you very much i don't much. know if i conquered it but. well i mean <laughs> it looked very much like it <laughs> um well i mean we 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 have now talked about two spaces which like uh, david's project and Liz's project we have now talked about two spaces which are connotated uh queer i wonder um is there a difference between queer space and queering space uh, we've talked about that quite a lot I, i i still don't really know how to wrap my head around maybe maybe christian you can give us an account on what's the difference between queering and queer space yeah of course um yeah um as you mentioned already lucas uh we talked about that a lot and thought about like do we have, like have a is this can a space be queer or is it about the sort of practice of queering and i think like uh, what we also saw in this uh contributions i mean uh before from liz and 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 david uh they uh they talk in a way about uh queer spaces uh, that we think of uh, which like spaces which like a gay bar or I don't know the dark room or uh, the cruising round a ballroom or I don't know a LGBTQI community center or something like that so we are interested in that as well of course definitely um, but we are also interested um, um, in, in something else I would say uh, which is uh, like the very mundane urban spaces like everyday spaces which um, 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 are not ready being understood as being like queer per se like the i don't know the the bench in the park under a tree or a street corner or um the parking lot or um at the supermarket, the supermarket cash yeah something like that um yeah we talked about the supermarket cash desk a lot uh in in terms of like what it what it actually means so can this can this be queer so um um uh so uh but um, I would say that spaces themselves are not necessarily queer, but it's like what we make out of them that we queer them, like as a as a as a sort of uh, form of practice. And um, I have to say, like like from sort of uh, my background, also as an urban sociologist, um, um, I tend to, in general, like talking about space, I tend to reject the idea of space as a container, as something with, which has four walls, as something which is material or uh, just physical. But uh, I, instead, instead I, I, I like to think of space as something which is produced, produced by people. So we make the space alive when we so we produce them it's relational um, 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 it's a process um, and uh, this is actually this is actually uh, uh, very much what we that we where we try to think of it as queering space and not queer space and there's a really nice quote by George Chauncey in an essay in the book uh, Start Architectures of Masculinity um, uh, where he wrote there is no queer space there are only spaces used by queers or put to queer use so that um, that actually uh, really uh, was dear to us in, in the way how we think about it and it's also I mean a lot of it is also about appropriation no? like um, spatial appropriation repurposing like buildings or typologies like the parking lot uh, claiming territories things like that so i think that's uh, uh, that's uh, super important and it's also um, uh, um, in that sense it like we queer spaces and activate them and inhabit them and transform them um, as as uh, sort of queer identifying individuals in that sense yeah yeah um Nancy, uh, you are an you are an activist as well, no? Um, so, what is what is the 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 term queering or the notion of queering in your practice as an activist in activism? Um, 
So maybe I take your question more towards understanding uh, queer as a, a act of protest on its own. Mm -hmm. So how do we see how do we see the queer activity or or uh, queer manifestation as a form of protest on its own, or how do we see protest as queer as well? Mm -hmm. If we study protest culture and um, a mass of bodies together, like protest in the very uh, uh, in the very visual sense of protest of bodies coming together to a space occupying a space for an ephemeral period of time and claiming that space. In that sense, I, I, I always like to argue for uh, bodies themselves as, as uh, ephemeral moving architectures. Uh, so if, if, if we go and protest in Hermannplatz, let's say, and we're a group of, um, uh, doesn't matter the number of bodies, uh, that action in itself is queer, as in it's a disruption to the status quo. And by that is, manifested also visually um, in space. Uh, it doesn't have to be protest in the sense of, of actually being a, in a demonstration with bodies. Protests can take different forms. And um, yeah, I just find it very interesting, the link between uh, uh, between protest culture and 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 uh, the link also between between queer movements and, and protest culture uh, as well, how it's it's something we've been fighting for it's not. It's it's often seen maybe when we look at the context of the uprisings that happened in the in the Arab region in the last uh, eleven year, ten years. Um, there's always been a section of the protests that have have always been also fighting for for queer rights LGBT, or LGBTQ plus community rights, and it shows us that most of these uh, most of these communities really take the like take on really important role in these protests. Uh, because in any protest, when you're when you're fighting one form of oppression, it's it, your fight is double when you're also fighting for for the existence as a queer individual. So yeah, maybe this gives a bit of. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's very that's very interesting. Kristen, do you want to add just, something? Uh, I just wanted to underline that, uh, that I think that uh, that we truly think that 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 practice of queering is something which is very political. No, it's like it's like a a, 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 a political act. Maybe something else that uh, me and Seshi have been talking about before, and uh, Seshi can later uh, talk more about it. Uh, what we say is like both uh, Seshi and I, we both are living in Berlin, but we're not German. Uh, so in a sense, uh, what we discussed about the manifestation of our the, uh, outer appearance even as queer, when we present ourselves as queer in the street, this is our way to reclaim space in a city that alienates us. So how do we as non-white, non-male, um, non-cis male bodies uh, moving in public space, how do we present ourselves, um, like uh, queer identity, visually speaking, becomes like an um, element we toy with. We use, it, we use it to play around to make people more shocked with, with that than where I come from, for example, or the fact that I, uh, the, for, for us, like to play, like qu queer identity gives me a lot of freedom to reclaim place and space and subvert this gaze of, I, I want people to, to see me colorful sometimes and I want people to see me, um, you yeah. know. What's the role of the city in that thought? Uh, the role is of the, in the city is the social proximity to, to other individuals and then you navigate spaces and any space you pass through, you affect it in a certain way. You get affected by it, obviously, but mm -hmm. um, but a city is a place where where there's a lot of proximity of bodies, especially it depends where in the city we're talking. Uh, but yeah, the city and, and the space is already built. Like when we look at the map as solid and void, it, if we're uh, focusing more on the void spaces, which are... Not the built-up, not the built-up areas, but the areas in between. And we look at the street. This is where activity really happens. This is where, this is where social proximity happens, and this is where all these, um, uh, this is where queerness is born because it's, this is where status quo manifests itself as as a norm and as a as a certain norm. And this is where we challenge the norms on a more obvious level. Yeah. Um, thank you. I would actually like to move on to have to have a to have a look at another project. Um, maybe we can have a look at uh, Nini Godaritz's illustration now. Nini's contribution to queering space uh, to, to the queering space archive is also a very political contribution, which deals very much with the concrete context of the the political but also spatial situation in Tbilisi. Um, can we see the picture already? Okay. Um, Nini, maybe you can say a few words about yourself and uh, about the 
Queer Madonna, your project, your contribution to the archive. And I would be very, very interested in, well, I mean, I'm, I know it somehow, but I would like to hear it from you as well, uh, why the Queer Madonna is specifically situated in that particular place in Tbilisi. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Mimi Kadoridze. Uh, I'm a fashion designer and visual artist. Uh, and uh, my friend David uh, translates my texts. Um, so, me Vumushop, Sposta Medium, she, Robert Sats Miss Design, she has a visual hello, Nebashida, maybe Kuleva Damien's Hell Labs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so she's saying that she's like, um, she's uh, also like uh, trying to explore herself, uh, and uh, uh, so she's trying to explore herself through her body and explore her identity and other people's identities uh, through the uh, bodies. And so that's why when she's working, she's always making this uh, body things when she's making costumes, for example, and uh, so she's often often trying to make things look like the part of body skin and such like things. Madonna <laughs> So this uh, cyber Madonna thing, it's not like this, um, it's like this thing, it's like archiving, because it's like uh, this Madonna, not just like uh, part of her fantasy, there is, were tra trans women who, uh, as you know, uh, in times of pan pandemic, they couldn't stand on coaching area, area so they... Uh, didn't have like a work anymore and one um one trans woman whose name is madonna she tried to burn herself in front of city hall building and it was like very uh, of course a uh, awful thing that happened and she was like she nearly died because she was trying to commit suicide so thanks god he she is now alive and but it was a really shocking thing and that there is um so it, it was like kind of protest and uh, okay okay uh, the, uh... I mean, trying to know what she was doing, but I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to the <laughs> <laughs> so the point is like she, uh, she was telling us that uh, it's like really uh, the thing that she was uh, try was trying to uh, show in this uh, in her work that uh, there is nothing like uh, our government doesn't help uh, help queer people at all and it's like not only for trans women but uh, but of course especially for trans women but uh, for other queer people so it's really hard to live here like because uh, you you can find a work and like sing as well so and
and uh, this uh, Mad Madonna is a cyborg because it's like uh, sometimes when you are visible queer um, person in, in Georgia, sometimes you have to be like uh, be really superhuman because it's like very hard in Georgia to uh, show your identity, be yourself, and that's why like this Madonna who was burned, she is still alive, and that's why she is standing like um, in front of this city hall building, but she is not a human. He is more than she is. Uh, she is more than human because of this because uh, she, she she lived very uh, hard life and it's like really uh, very hard to live in Georgia when you're a queer uh, mm -hmm. person okay Th thank you so much I think that was a wonderful a wonderful statement actually you have to be a superwoman you have to be a superhero to be able to cope with visibility or to be able to be visible um, that's very very interesting so um, a project dealing with visibility and especially visibility in urban public space is the project that we are going to have a look at next. Um, I would like to ask for the clip by Cecile and Nancy and then we can have a little chat about it. So thank you. The clip you just saw, it's called Oro and it was created by Cecile and uh, Nancy nasser -Aldin. Um I would like to ask uh, Cecile first. Uh, Cecile, can you say a few words about yourself, about your practice as a, as a performer, as an artist? And uh, also, what is Oro? Who is Oro and who are you in Oro in the clip that we just saw? Hi, I am Qi Shi Lei, originally from Taiwan, now based in Berlin. I am a multidisciplinary artist, musician, and Bhutto dancer, and currently also a researcher on sexuality, queerness, and decolonization. And um, so to talk about this collective, um, I will start um, from talking about what is our practice. So because before we were um, officially coming up with the name of the collective, we have been developing practice for um, around two years. So we started as a um, healing practice to reflect on our trauma that are related with our queerness and the colorness on our skin. So we did it in the beginning in the so-called safe space, the private space, as um, in a very somatic way. So, and we also been creating different scores. They're starting from um, interaction with physical structure and we use the physical structure or the architectural space as a metaphor to bring in the complexity of um, power dynamic and intimacy. Yeah. And I want to mention a little bit of the background of this video. So it was last year in the early summer and it was during the pandemic time. And so it was um, 
it was not a plan that we go out with him that we're going to make a video of our intervention. But instead, before this video, we, we lost um, around four videos that we intentionally do a shooting for making an intervention in the public space. But um, both of our phones fell into the water. So we lose um, the planned shooting of our video. And then this one just came up as um, after we did a dance research, we went out, want to have a walk. And then we arrive at this space. And yeah, so there was something that is calling us to stay there and let's say respond to what has been happening there. So now I also want to bring a little bit of the aspect that um, in the practice of oral, we want to focus on there is an invisible forces that one might call magic, one might call spirit, that um, we are addressing this big otherness that has been excluded from the dominant culture as something Yeah, something that is left in silence. And um, we find this also connected with um, a queerness from the non-Western culture. This I will skip a little bit of um, why it comes here. Um, so the practice of oral, we want to we want to explore the dimension also of um, spirituality healing together with the power dynamic that we encounter directly in the context of a city. And also how a body that has a memory and context of history of its own entering a space um, that has a script of another history and how we need to interact and remaking dialogue within ourselves and with without, um, with the outer world that is inserting this fictive script into our body. Mm -hmm. Teshi, have you, have you learned about the, the places where you live or the cities where you live through your practice as a performer? So do you think you get to know the city where you live in much better through practicing what you do? Mm, I have to say that um, I did more public practice in Berlin more than in my own city because the resistance um, that I sense within myself in my own city where I'm coming from is bigger than mm -hmm. here I am already being an alienated mm -hmm. entity or person. Mm -hmm. So here, um, even if I do nothing, even I'm not intent to perform, people sometimes read as I am performing something. Right. So in this case, the effort of um, or the necessity of making a performance becomes um, ambivalent. So I can play with um, being a performer or not performing. So in general, um, here I can, we can play in between the performative space and the non-performative space in a way that empowers ourselves more than in my own city. Okay, that's very interesting. Nancy, I would like to turn to you since you since you did oral together with Cecile. Um, in several conversations, you mentioned that you also see yourself as a movement researcher. I, I really came to appreciate this term very, very much because I, I chose to believe that this is possible, that through movement we can research the environment where we live in, the cities that we live in, and also ourselves, of course. Um, so how would you describe your practice as a movement researcher? That's a very nice question. Thank you. Thank you, Tseshi, so much. I'm really happy to hear you speak about Oro. <laughs> uh, and whatever Tseshi said, uh, they spoke on behalf of the two of us. I need to second that. I, uh, so through movement research, uh, I will um, repeat bigger gestures that Tseshi already mentioned. Um, uh, in a way, when you, when, uh, when you put your body in a space and move in a certain way, uh, you are naturally presenting this like uh, spectator uh, to perform our kind of uh, dynamic which we try to also really disrupt 
Uh, but in general, a movement doesn't always have to be as a spectator and a performer. Uh, a lot of uh, movement research that I, there's uh, also on the archive uh, another entry where that people can visit from Bardot Collective, which is another um, collective that's really bottom up. We started with the friends in Berlin, um, mostly all coming from uh, uh, from different backgrounds, as in different cities around the world, mostly in what's problemati problematically referred to as the global south. Uh, also, mostly queer people are in the uh, group, so we like to see each other as a, a research movement, uh, as, as a collective that's researching movement. Um, uh, what's really nice about it is, is the way we, you experience space is different uh, when, uh, when you experience it through your body and not, not only through theories. You really project, you really put your body in that practice of, of understanding space and then do it the same way you, 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 you work with gravity, you work with the walls, you work with other bodies around you, it all becomes part of a bigger uh, context. And then uh, you start seeing yourself as also part of the context. And um, yeah, I think I'm learning still a lot through, uh, through Oro. Uh, with Seshi, it's something we do uh, like, it, we're really sensitive to space in the sense we could be in the metro uh, together underground and really see how people are looking at us and then we just do a certain move and then people's people's uh, move, uh, perception changes or uh, some people like walk away, some people look more and and then you see the power you have in it, within movement, within your own body, movement that's already, like our bodies, uh, like Seshi also mentioned, are sculpted to, to act in this fictive uh, performativity often in public space. So in the metro we're supposed to sit and take up little space and, and look down look down and not, and not um, interact with strangers. And then sometimes I see myself just by smiling to people in the metro. That for me is a movement research. Mm -hmm. Like, how is the response to 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 that sort of um, trigger that I create in space? So it's a lot of experiments. In uh, so sometimes it could be just dressing a certain way and walking in the street, or stopping somewhere and stretching. Stretching in the metro is already something that's and that's queering, research. no. That in, it, it, yeah, in, totally. in, in a in a certain sense. So totally. so like smiling to the person next to you on the on the on a on a train could actually you know it's off the norm it, it's going to irritate people absolutely gonna, yeah. absolutely especially in the context of uh, of germany let's say uh, where it's not as uh, uh, as normal to 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 randomly speak with a stranger and this is something maybe uh, Tseshi and I also bring from our backgrounds that it's maybe more uh, uh, more normal for us to speak to strangers or start start a conversation with someone yeah. we don't know. So this is something I find myself doing on on in everyday practices. And this mm -hmm. is something also Bardo Collective we're doing a lot by like just putting ourselves in one space in the street and and taking over the space. And how do you? Sorry if I interrupt. But, uh, how do you choose those spaces? What kind of spaces are we talking about? I mean, are those spaces? Um, particularly unsafe or are they particularly safe or do they have a certain condition why you choose them? I think the city in general is an unsafe space to a large extent because uh, uh, how we choose spaces uh, it's not always an intention uh, and and how we choose to do an activity, whether on a personal level or on a collective level, well, obviously, when you do more collective work, then there is a bit of logistical thinking of uh, what space is uh, like. Uh, for example, with uh, with my research with Bardo, uh, we have not had access to studios to 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 rehearse in a lot. So we we rehearse a lot in one of the housing collectives, uh, the housing project that that part of the team lives in, uh, or in our houses. But then when we don't, we can't. Uh, be in the indoor spaces we just go out in the in a park or in the street with Seshi also we've taken up a lot of spaces in parks sometimes in the summer and people were really uh, like we like by 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 per, by starting something in a space you change the movement around you you change the navigation of mm -hmm. space you change uh, the so architecture we, of the you space. change the architecture yeah. of the space and that's why i mentioned before of like seeing bodies as ephemeral architecture in a sense i mean um by by standing in the metro and and if i just sit down low in the metro if i squat uh, then I allow for a different kind of space above my head and around me if if my legs are stretched in a certain way or mm -hmm. Uh, also, there's something, the power of collective, I think that's very important, the power of community and the power of collectivity uh, in the sense of all of this. I feel much stronger when I'm with Seshi mm -hmm. or with Bardot to do such interventions uh, and I find it 
I feel more safe when I do it with others mm -hmm. than when I do it on my own. I still find myself doing it on my own a lot. Uh, for example, today I just had my earphones e on and, um, and I was walking through a long tunnel in the underground and I started dancing my way through because it was a very long tunnel and I could really see people looking weird at me. Mm -hmm. But then when me and Seshi are on the opposite sides of the street and we look at each other and we start dancing to each other, people still find it weird. But when there's another person doing it, you somehow gain validation um, or like less stress of, of being too overly seen and not knowing how to react to it. Yeah, it's, a, it's about doing things together, no? It's about... Uh, like if we're weird or awkward together, yeah. then then we're already setting a yes. disruption of the norm and we're creating maybe... We're creating new norms even, no? Creating new rules. Um, you, I, I would like to open up the discussion to a general, mm, let's say, discourse on what safe spaces or unsafe spaces are. Um, I would like to turn to Liz at this, at this moment. Um, or for, for, for this occasion. Uh, Liz, when, where do you feel safe? Um, well, I think that's a complicated question. <laughs> um, <laughs> because first, I don't think that safe, safe, safe space really exists at all. Um, even in a space that is constructed by bodies that are in search of safe space. But I'm also speaking from a very specific, very different positionality. I can only speak from the position of um, a white Western voice um, or like a immigrant Jewish voice in Germany or a queer um, non-binary voice, you know, and in a way to even, I think, like identify these platforms is already creating unsafe space here somehow um, in the sense that um, yeah, I just think that it's, it's a construct, actually. I think that we can work to create, um, safer spaces or, you know, like recognize each other as queer people, but I, I wouldn't say that queer space in itself is safe, is a safe feeling either. Um, and I think that's something that is also really important to talk about, mm. um, and what, how that how that uh, reads differently for everybody. And I think it's really interesting to hear already what um, folks are talking about right now in terms of, you know, we're all living our different narratives as queer people in an urban space. Um, and I think it's also a lot about the feeling of, in the feeling of visibility versus invisibility the positions of privilege that people are in to make the choice to feel visible or invisible in, which I think a lot about, um, a lot actually, um, what that means for queer people um, when one can choose to feel visible or invisible, if one can choose to feel visible or invisible and when you make those choices, what what is the, um, you know, what what is the desire or the, um, decision in that moment, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a complicated question in that um, it's something that safe space is not, an, for me personally, is not something that can be established as a kind of utopian concept, even in um, a space that is deemed like queer somehow. Um, but I think that it's a conversation that needs to be dismantled more amongst queers actually um and uh not just assumed that every yeah. queer space is a safe space yeah no i mean it's obvious it's obviously not and I'm, i mean there are also different communities which which choose to to create rather exclusive spaces just for them in order to create some sort of let's say safety right so so um, this 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 notion of inclusivity and exclusivity I, I totally agree that's definitely something which needs to be talked about that's definitely something also which needs to be questioned because um, Inclusivity does not necessarily always mean that everything's going to be fine and we are going to be happy, clappy, living together, no? I mean, uh, sometimes sometimes a, a certain notion of exclusivity is, 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 can be quite, quite, quite interesting to, 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 to think about. Um, I would like to... Uh, uh, thank you, Liz, very much. Um, 
you've already mentioned uh, the term visibility. Um, maybe we can, maybe we can, maybe we can also ask someone else about their their uh, their take on what visibility in in their queer practice or practice as artists performers means. Um, maybe maybe uh, David, you could say a few words about about visibility in your practice. Yeah, for sure. For me, like visibility is very you know, like not easy thing to talk about, as I already mentioned, because uh, you know, and it's like when you are talking about your visibility and or someone else's visibility, it's it's always about some some someone's readiness to be like visible at all. It's it's I'm not always talking about like being queer, and for in our country, visibility is very uh, hard thing to do. I mean, like. Um, I just told me just queer space there at all our social construct that works that you can do whenever you want like uh, but there is some very big moral frames uh, that you be like you should to live in them but I mean like you can uh, they just don't care for real if you are gay or not or what are you doing for example in your life you can like just uh, do such a lot of uh, immoral thing, uh, things for them, but you should to hide it. It's like all Georgian culture is about this, that you should to, uh, do whatever you want, but you should not to show, showing it. So for Georgian people, for me as well, like um, visibility is very uh, strange thing because it's not like um, our cul culture doesn't represent like visibility like a good thing. So it's like, uh, it's like even a little impolite in Georgia to uh, be visible because uh, you just uh, like uh, um, you just uh, show uh, should to show yourself only your family on your with yourself so it's like really hard here to talk about visibility because and uh, you shouldn't like uh, force anyone to uh, be visible for example and in Georgia it's always a very big problem because here are some for example uh, uh, some queer organizations they're like um, like kind of forcing other queer people to like make and coming out and it's like always and they don't understand that it's like some uh, it's very hard for some people to be visible in our um, in our city for example mm -hmm. but Tbilisi is the best uh, example of like queer safe place because mm -hmm. other Georgia is like just hell. Mm -hmm. Do you think the, the the corona situation has changed anything about, about yeah, it changed. It queer changed, visibility in, in public way, space yeah. in cities? Yeah, yeah, of, of course, because you know it's like um, anyway. Of course, it wasn't a very good situation in Georgia about so queer visibility, but uh, here was some like uh, let's some say that it was queer safe places. Of course, there wasn't like one hundred percent safe, but uh, there were, were placing uh, places which was like inclusive. Places, yes. For example, like Pasiani, it's like um, big club. Yeah, it's close. I think you know, you heard about it. So um, it's like uh, made really big change because, for example, I had my some people from like maybe who was uh, studying in the same school who were like homophobic, and after that, after visiting Pasiani, it wasn't like this exclusive place. Yes, it was like inclusive place for real because there wasn't just for queer. It wasn't just queer parties there, so all people can go there uh, and. Uh, it was really changing a lot of people mm -hmm. and a lot of young generation changed them. Maybe in their families, they're still like uh, trying to be homophobic, but in this place, everyone's like really felt safe. And for now, there is no uh, such a place like this, but you know, queer activists move now to the social media, for example, um, on TikTok like in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, there are like a lot of queer activists who are trying to like show the um, and and it works maybe it works uh, even more better than Bassiani and mm -hmm. other queer real real oh, places okay. because like yeah that's an interesting account Christian maybe maybe you could you could say a few words about the erosion of uh, of, of of queer spaces now during the pandemic i know that you've been doing a little research on that um yeah, maybe maybe we can start already before the pandemic because I think that I mean uh, the erosion um, of those venues and spaces that we see today has already started. I think uh, uh, much earlier. So we like if you look at cities like London, there's research been done that that almost half of the 
the queer or um, uh, queer friendly venues had to close down. If we look at, I don't know, San Francisco, where um, like one of the last uh, lesbian bars closed like already like five years ago. And we see that in Berlin here as well, no? Like um, uh, our dear uh, spaces, they closed before. And it's, uh, I mean, that's a, a sort of um, urban, that's part of the sort of main urban development, I would say, not only for queer spaces, and you can call this uh, gentrification, yeah? Uh, so um, uh, that could be one, one possibility, you know, where sort of more affluent businesses and people move in and uh, um, uh, those who are less affluent um, are forced to move out, and uh, um, that holds true also for, for um, uh, these queer venues, I would say. And... Um, yeah, and in that sense, uh, we uh, like this is a process which started right early, and um, as we see also like with other with other uh, situations or perspectives, um, the pandemic is just a sort of like magnifying glass in a way or an accelerator of like uh, eroding uh, these places uh, which are dear to us in a way. And but on the other hand, I I would say it's uh, it's uh, like putting up the question. It's uh, to not always end so negatively on these things. But, uh, we can also think about of this as like opening up new po possibilities. And I think what, what David just said, like with uh, uh, his project that they are trying to do, uh, is uh, also the question where uh, like this uh, current situation is like opening up new possibilities. And we see like a couple of them, like in the last year, no? that we, mm -hmm. that we like new spaces pop up, like where uh, people uh, like like-minded people meet together and celebrate their identities and all these kind of things. So um, uh, which are less uh, sort of um, ingrained like within a sort of capitalist urban world as well and uh, uh, and that is that has always been the power i think of like queering spaces also to sort of like appropriate those spaces and uh, 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 make them uh, your own um, outside of a sort of normative uh, way of uh, um, um, like urban life in that sense I, I think that's actually that's very interesting because then th there we can go back to that quote from the very beginning where it says um, where it said the devastated city that the men have abandoned. No, like all of a sudden there are those new gaps and those new um, open spaces which can all of a sudden be newly appropriated or newly freshly claimed let's say or, or or spaces that we can find anew i mean when we think about last summer no i mean berlin was full with and i'm only talking about berlin no but berlin was full with those examples the exactly or, or um really alternative spaces where there's been really it's it, I mean, it hasn't been really announced or uh, geolocations were not shared yeah. uh, publicly, but I mean, you can you can close the institutions, but but there is way to, if we're talking necessarily about party culture, uh, party culture doesn't only have to, like, doesn't only have to happen in the institutionalized places. I mean, all clubs are institutions in the end of the day. So like, how how do we claim this act of, of uh, experiencing pleasure or, or uh, or being around other bodies in the absence of institutions mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So, um. Mm -hmm. um, since the since queering common space is an archive, I have I have one last que one last question to to David and Nini maybe. Um, David, you are an art historian, and uh, I guess the idea of archiving is rather important in your practice as an art historian as well. I was wondering, um, how do you see, what do you think the potential of archiving narratives, ideas, thoughts, memories uh, could be? Yeah, no, for me, it's like archiving is a really important thing, uh, not only about queer uh, culture and in Georgia, especially because like in Georgia, we don't have a culture of archiving anything. For example, we have like a lot of um, like art historians, yes, but uh, there we, uh, we don't do archives. I know only one, um, like, or maybe two archives were trying to archive 
uh, contemporary art. And for now, the platform uh, for I'm um, doing for now, yes, with my friends, uh, it is kind of archive as well because uh, we are now working on a website which uh, which should be uh, presenting this uh, queer um, art uh, like an archive. It will be uh, archive. So uh, for me, it's very important because uh, it's not just important for just for all society. It's very important for queer people because um, you know it's like. Um, for if, if I will be like queer people who have has no um, nothing about who has so much to explore about uh, um, they they self yes uh, the, if there will be like some archive who is like showing the uh, what uh, what the really queer community is in this country uh, where he um, or where where they from it will be very uh, good for that person for so for me like archive it's not uh, just for a uh, Publicity or something, or of course, it's it's very important for history. But uh, to have an archive, it's very important for some um, like uh, persons. I mean, like queer persons who are who are exploring themselves. So that's why I think it's very important. And I think that um, for me, it's like um, so for our uh, for for we are working for now. It's not only just with uh, artists, queer artists, with it, all kind of uh, queer people. And it's like, I think that everything should, should be archived, every thought, every like um, every word, because it's very important. So that's what we are doing for nowadays, like queer community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Christian, you wanted to say, no, mention wanted, something? Yeah, no, I just wanted to add, I think that, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, the project also that you mentioned and that you just started, David, uh, I think that um, uh, in that sense of archiving, super interesting. And that is also something that which is interesting to our archive as well. And I really like this notion of an everyday archive, no? that it's, it's not about archiving, I don't know, the dominant culture or whatever, um, uh, like what, what some people in power deem as archivable, no? Uh, it's about it's about sort of like making these records or like recording like really everyday mundane things and making them at available um, maybe at a later stage and who knows, like maybe it's like some form of a time capsule mm -hmm. that we can establish here and, and people look back and yes. and just uh, like also sort of find their sort of like queer experiences as well. And an interesting example for, uh, is is the, um, the Lesbian History um, Archive. I don't know if you if you know that in New York, which which really does important um, um, uh, work on like really archiving those everyday uh, 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 things that, that usually no one like deems archivable in that sense. Yeah, and in a sense, like in the archive, we see that uh, the mundane things could be like uh, putting uh, uh, a curtain in your very dry office, putting this uh, shiny golden curtain. That could be very mundane, everyday practice, very ephemeral as well. Like Charlotte did, yeah, you know, in the archive. Exactly, like Charlotte did. Uh, but also, in a way, uh, we, we are very aware to step away from creating binaries of what is queer and what is not queer. And in that sense, the, the, the contributions into the archive we're creating uh, really don't have a limitation on what we consider queer enough or not queer enough in the sense of uh, um, yeah, visual representation maybe. And, and that's, why, that's why this archive is, for me, I think is very important that it, it, uh, it supports different uh, forms of media because mm. different people have different ways of expressing and what you uh, deem is important to you to document and keep there living in the collect also when i put my story with the stories of others it starts making uh we don't want to romanticize obviously like uh, this archive being an like obviously we aspire for it to be a completely inclusive space but like uh, liz uh, already mentioned even queer spaces on their own are not safe spaces by yeah. default how do we together uh, create create these spaces and and question my positionality within this archive within other queer narratives how do I get visibility maybe of other queer narratives? Also stepping away from uh, what uh, David mentioned earlier, um, maybe sometimes visibility acts against you, not mm -hmm. with you. Uh, mm -hmm. So how do we not parachute this very Western idea of coming out or of, of showing our colorfulness? Yeah. Uh, uh, maybe maybe in my hometown, I don't necessarily feel the need to uh, to look queer and, mm -hmm. and go out, uh, walk around the streets of Baalbek because mm -hmm. I have a lot of other fights to fight before that. I want electricity yes. in my house before, mm -hmm. I, before I want that. So how do we talk about intersectionality and about a lot of other identities yes. that come within uh, our being as, as collective individuals that mm -hmm. happen to be also queer. Mm -hmm. 
We have a very can interesting question. Oh, sorry. Quick response. Can I say one quick response? Sure, sure, please. Because I think that was a really beautiful, um, a really beautiful just reaction. What what you just said, and it made me think a lot about um, a book that I was just reading by um, an academic named Fiona Anderson, who wrote. Um, a book that's sort of an, an experimental autobiographical account of David, the artist David Wanarovich's experiences in New York through cruising, actually. But she specifically talks about like the fractures and ruins of urban space as the places in which queer histories are kind of like absorbed and how important those and she talks about them literally in terms of architecture, but also in terms of how bodies and architecture um, are are in this constant like conversation with each other, and I think that it's really interesting how um, how you were just talking about yeah what how you were just talking about that or how we've been talking about that, but to think about it in terms of like queer space as, as constant fractured space mm -hmm. and what that is and what that's doing and how in a way. Um, that is an archive that is unarchivable, and that's a very important element to kind of queer um, ephemerality and queer history. And that you know we carry our stories in our in our physical bodies as well, in a way. So they're not necessarily archivable. You know. Anyway, it just made me think about about that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. We have a we have a very interesting question here uh, from a viewer from Amman, from Jordan. Um, it's Amir, and Amir asks, um, or Amir tells us that uh, together with a group of queer artists and architects and activists, they have started a similar project like Queer in Common Space, so we have to get in touch, please. Um, and uh, they are collecting or they are writing queer, they are writing about queer spaces around Amman that's once existed or still do uh, and they did interviews and testimonials and they have already been recorded and uh, now the material is being processed and processed to be to to uh, to, to, to to become visible and now the question to you or to us is um, from our experience or from your experience, what can one do that those spaces can become visible without being jeopardized, without being denounced? Hmm. Anyone? Hmm. Super difficult, I think. I mean, we, we, we had this uh, debate also when we started the project also together with Nancy and I remember where uh, our first thought because like being planners or architects is what we do is like we do a map and then we said yeah but we can't do a map no because we don't want to sort of single out those spaces and locate them like on the map and uh, even even if some people who tell us about these experiences are are happy to sort of uh, disclose them or the, disclose their location uh, but um, um, on the other hand there are some people who really depend on those spaces and also depend on them of yeah. not being publicly available so I think it, but it's a super difficult it's a super difficult it's question how can you be like make make these spaces visible uh, whereas at the same time like also like putting them into danger that they That's can no longer with mapping yeah. in yeah. general or archiving in that sense and and then we thought of, of mapping and not necessarily being tied to only a location but but the archive in its own is a form of mapping of, of uh, an array of different uh, experiences and maybe in a sense like uh, in the context of Amman um, uh, what, what was the name? Uh, Amin? Amir. Amin. Uh, I think Amir. Amin, Amir. Amir. Uh, Amir, you and your colleagues, you probably know the local context better to understand how, what spaces to expose and what spaces not to, and what spaces to protect as such, because this is a problem. I worked also in Cairo for a while, and I was working in mapping projects, and this was a project that, this was a problem that really continuously came up. How do we highlight in between spaces without, without necessarily like jeopardizing them in the sense of we don't want to put the light too much on them then they know like we're looking for the queers where are they then we go and catch them we can we can use pseudonames sometimes we can use you don't need to necessarily you i mean the community knows its way to find its way to the spaces that are not announced so maybe talk about them talk about that we exist 
to 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 make it more uh, visible for other people who maybe don't have access to these places to understand that we exist, but not not necessarily publish uh, publicly material about a place that we want to protect if it's really a sacred place that we yeah. don't want the police to know about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's basically why we decided to not do that map, but do an archive because it sort of creates some kind of abstract visibility. It just talks about the fact that those um, memories, mm. experiences are out there, but we don't really know where they are. And I think for uh, like, like our political agenda here is actually to make visible that those narratives count, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it's important to, to, to know that those narratives are out there and that those memories and experiences and traumas and, you know, ideas of what, uh, what, what mm -hmm. queer is, um, is out there. And we don't, need, we don't necessarily need to know where. Right. I mean, it doesn't matter unless, unless it's really important for unless the, for the person sharing their story that it's yes. important to them to but know that this happened yeah. right here. Yeah. Or maybe then you keep your own uh, uh, your own identity anonymous yeah. and present the space. Identity depends like on the story. It's very yeah. case specific. Uh, a comment from from the guests? No. No. OK, that was that was wrong. OK. Um, Apparently, we are almost at the end of the time. Um, are there any final statements or final comments or queries that y you, you folks want to say? I would have liked to see if Tseshi had something more to say because they disconnected for a while. I would maybe say something really short after all these um, series of disconnection. So... Um, just a very personal comment to the archive that um, with all these bodies that are networked together, it was clear to me that body already um, exists as a um, queer archive of the queer histories that we didn't even consciously know about. Yeah, so that is the thing that I want to add upon to the archive. Yeah, thank you very much. And also glad that you that you made it to that you managed to come back here. Um, okay, so I would like to thank all of you so much for joining. I would like to thank Nancy, Christian, David, Nini, Liz, and Zeshi for doing this together, for contributing to the archive, for being part of Queering Common Space. Uh, of course, I would like you folks out there to have a look at the website maybe again and or follow us on instagram or whatever you know and uh, maybe you maybe you find the urge or you feel the urge to contribute something as well you can do that on the website you can click submit and uh, contribute your personal approach your personal idea your personal memory what queering common space can be and uh, it will be published on the website so it's uh, www.queeringspace.xyz uh, so feel free to submit your story also i would like to thank the whole teddy team for inviting us for making this possible uh, especially in times like this it's so nice so so nice to actually be in a physical space and do something at least we some could do that some of us um i hope next time we can sit in the in in in, in one I big studio we were together all in the same space yeah absolutely but at least you know that's really kind of cool so um that that, that we that, that some people can be here so thank you very much for making that happen and um yeah thank you so much for joining and i would like to end and conclude with a little teaser that we produced for Queering Common Space and I wish you all a wonderful weekend and a wonderful life. <laughs>